This is a level 2 restricted area. Stand still and submit for verification. Access granted. You are 3 minutes late for work. So last week I realised I've never made an original sci-fi animation for this channel. I knew that that had to change at some point so I jumped in and started working on this video. I picked up a ton of tricks and tips along the way and I wanted to pass those on to you today in case you try something similar yourself. This video has been sponsored by Concept D, a new brand by Acer. They sent me this Concept D7 Spatial Labs Edition laptop to make the project. It delivers a full stereoscopic 3D experience and it's very cool, we'll talk more about that later. Let's just jump in for now and take a look at this project and see how it was all put together. So first we're going to talk about the gate section. The welcome screen for the display was actually made in Blender. I wanted a really simple 90s looking corny sort of sci-fi aesthetic for the screen so I just jumped into Blender and decided to make the graphics there. I just used a few text elements and I gave them an emission material then I animated the little H logo so that it would keep spinning around. One of the problems you have when you light something with an emission material is that you lose all sense of the 3D shape of the space because it has no shadows. So one way that I fixed that was to use the layer weight node and I plugged that into a colour ramp and I used that to control the colour of the emission so that whichever parts of the letter H were facing the camera would have a different colour to the parts on the side. So I rendered out that image sequence as a seamless loop and I just used that as an emission texture for the screen. All of the other screens I just made in Photoshop and I used different mix RGB nodes to control which screens were visible. This can get a little bit confusing but you can basically just daisy chain a bunch of mix nodes together and you can change the keyframe on the factor to make different screens appear at different times. If you want to know more about this sort of technique I made a whole video last year on how you can make a controllable phone using entirely just shader nodes and effects like this. The really satisfying gate animation was actually very easy to do. You could probably do this with constraints or drivers or something, but I actually found a much faster method, at least for me. I just modeled one bar for the gate, and then I used an array to copy it multiple times and applied the array. Then I keyframed the animation of the gate so it would swing open. But to make all of the bars open at separate times, I separated each one of them into their own mesh and then I just had to go through each one of the bars and offset the keyframes by two or three frames per time so that each one of the keyframes would be triggered slightly after the one before it. The cool thing about doing it like this is you can just select all the bars and you can manipulate all the keyframes at once. For instance, I thought the animation was a little bit slow so I could just scale down all the keyframes and now it would happen faster. If I wanted to move the whole thing around to a different point in the animation, I could just select them all and move it where I wanted. The large cliff in the background that the landing pad sits on was actually made using Blender's Ant Landscape Generator add-on. It comes with Blender, you just have to turn it on in the preferences. That does a pretty good job of making some basic landscapes, but they do look a little bit generic, so I usually like to go into the sculpting tools and just add a little bit of extra variation. Then I just quickly UV unwrapped it and I give it a rock texture. The texture set that came with this did have a height map, so I could add a little bit of extra displacement, but unfortunately the displacement kind of just looked like spikes. You might have seen this problem before, if you lower the subdivisions it doesn't really help, if you increase the subdivisions the spikes just get worse. If you ever get this problem there is a little trick that you can use to fix it usually. If you go into the displacement settings and you change the mapping type from local to UV, as long as you've got a UV map that should fix the problem. 
Now large terrains like this tend to look very repetitive with some visible tiling. You can usually break that up a little bit quite successfully just by mixing in either a noise texture or a musgrave texture into the base colour. So I just added a mix node and I set that to multiply with the noise plugged in and I just add some extra dark patches that are in different places to the other tiling on the mesh. Combine that with the dark lighting and you can't really say where the mesh tiles. Now originally I did use some micro displacement on this kind of dotted metal floor. I don't tell to use micro displacement very often because it can be quite demanding on the computer. Now this laptop has plenty of processing power because it's got a Intel Core i7 CPU, but I still had to actually turn the displacement off eventually for a different reason. I did a few test renders and it looked completely fine with like a thousand samples, but for some reason the floor was coming out like really blurry every time when the denoiser was turned on. So I just had to kill the displacement and that fixed the issue. Mixmo is a really great resource for free characters and motion capture data. All I had to do was alter the base materials to make them look pretty realistic. And I thought it looked quite good, I actually got fairly brave with the character and had him quite close to the camera. I think it still looked pretty decent. I downloaded this fella with an in place animation which means that he doesn't actually walk forward anywhere, he's just animated almost as if he was moving but he stays in the same place. So if you hover over the timeline and you press shift E, you can make the animation cyclic which means it'll just repeat forever. Then all you have to do is animate the base bone position so that he'll move across the floor and as long as so you make sure the animation speed matches the speed he's actually moving in 3D space so there's no slipping, it looks pretty good. To finish off building out all the base structures I used a few free assets from Sketchfab. As you'll know if you watch my other videos, I usually use a bunch of different scans and free models just to quickly make the background elements in these animations. Now to keep all of these files organised and to preview my models, I really like using the inbuilt model viewer that comes with the Spatial Labs edition of this Concept D7. It's got a handy little bridge add-on called Instant Preview so you can just send your model straight from Blender to the viewer where you can see them in full 3D. I mean, not only does it have a full 3D stereoscopic experience, but it also has this cool eye tracking feature where the model actually moves around in 3D space depending on how you're looking at the laptop. You can see this really unique effect, almost like you're peering straight into an actual 3D world with proper parallax and things. It's very cool. Right, so now let's finish off this thing with the really fun stuff, the spaceship. I wanted this whole piece to look really grounded in reality. Just because it's sci-fi doesn't mean you have to cover everything with neon lights and flashy looking technology. So with that in mind, I tried to use fairly simple, boxy, industrial looking shapes for meshes like the shipping containers and the actual spaceship itself. Basically, I just added a load of boxes and I used the bevel tool to make the designs look a little bit less boring. There really wasn't much more to it than that. I knew that I could get away with a lot because Blender has this really cool trick to instantly make things look more sci-fi. If you select a mesh and go into edit mode, you can search for the discombobulator add-on if you've got it turned on and you'll get this little pop-up. This add-on builds extra paneling onto all your objects based on a few tweakable parameters. It's a really excellent way to add some grey builds to your sci-fi objects and as long as all the basic silhouette and the shape of the object is good, you'll usually get some pretty nice designs out of it. Now this method of just adding grey builds all over a basic shape is being used in sci-fi since at least Star Wars and it's held up to the test of time because frankly we're still doing it now. Actually animating the ship was really easy, I just parented everything to an empty and I keyframed its location and rotation. And to make the animation a little bit less boring, I opened up the curve editor and I used a noise modifier on the Y axis of the ship's rotation. That just added a little bit of nice secondary motion as the ship moves around, made everything look a little bit less robotic. Now obviously I wanted the movements to be more precise as the ship actually places down the cargo container. You would think that you could do that just by animating this little influence control, but nope, for some reason that isn't an option, you can't actually do anything but toggle it on and off. So what I had to do was I just made the noise end a certain keyframe, and then I just copied the whole noise modifier and I made it start up again later on. Now finally to create the smoke, I just opened up a whole new blend file and I copied and pasted in the ship, 
and everything that's around the ship. I made the ship and the ground elements fluid effectors, which means that smoke would bounce off them instead of going through them. Then I placed a few fluid emitters just underneath the engines and I parented those to the ship so they would copy the movement. If you select one of the emitter meshes, you can control how much velocity the smoke inherits from the emitter. So if you set that to a value of say one, the smoke will continue forward after the ship stops due to momentum like it realistically would. You can also increase the normal emission value to make the smoke shoot out faster and further from the emitter. Now once I was happy with all the settings for that, I baked out the fluid and I copied it into my main file. Into the smoke's material settings, I just added an attribute node and I typed in density so I could get the density information for the volume. Then I plugged that into a colour ramp and I used that to control the thickness of the smoke based on the actual density that was emitted. Originally I had this plugged straight into an emission shader. Now that does render out faster but it doesn't look quite as good because you don't get volumetic shadows. So in the end I just swapped out that material for a volume shader. After the rendering was done it was time for a little bit of colour grading and post work. Now I tried to keep this pretty simple. I just shifted the tones a little bit towards the green and the blue palette. I added a little bit of extra fog using a mist pass and I also added in some glare and some film grain. I've really enjoyed using this laptop for my last few videos when it comes to the grading and compositing stuff because it has this beautiful 4K screen and it's got really accurate colours. It uses Adobe RGB colour gamut which means that it can produce more colours than a typical sRGB display. Now if you imagine this triangle represents every possible colour that can be viewed with the human eyes, the smaller triangle represents what a normal sRGB screen can show and the larger triangle shows you the Adobe RGB colour gamut. So as you can see you're getting access to a lot more colours than you would typically get on a regular screen. Now once that final grid was done, the animation looked like the one you saw at the start of this video. I really hope you found this one useful, hit the like and subscribe button if you did. Don't forget to check out the link in the description to find out more about Concept D devices.